Nobody knows London. There is no knowledge which can understand it, no scientific measure to gauge its spell. The London map, a meaningless set of lines, long since distorted, a handbook for the blind. You have to succumb, become a tourist in your own city and get lost. London South Bank is where we begin. Building the South Bank Centre started in 1951. Additional work was added in 1967, courtesy of the Greater London Council. The capital's home for arts and performance had fallen on the shore that actors in the 1600s had inhabited when exiled from central London. Actors alongside prostitutes relocated to the other side of the river. Brothels and theatres laid the foundations of the eyesore that is 50s utopianism, the beauty that is the South Bank. For the last time, officials have threatened rebuilding the South Bank. Plans have been finalised. Building is to be completed by 2001 on the home of London skateboarders since 1976. That's 22 years of innovation, progression, learning, drinking, cinema, talking, fighting, mugging, ballet, living, breathing, art. Skateboarding changed South Bank, as did the South Bank change skateboarding. Put up barriers and watch skaters skate them. Carve grooves in the pavement before sets of steps and watch high-heeled pigeon women trip and break their ankles. Remove paving stones and give skaters new gaps to jump. Turn off the lights, give the skaters another challenge. Send down a security guard, watch him get smacked in the fucking mouth. Even the Dialogue in the Dark exhibition put on by the Royal National Institute for the Blind that took up almost every inch of South Bank space failed to stop skateboarding. Instead, all available surrounding space was skated daily and the exhibition was set on fire. What can appear simply as a concrete wall, a set of steps or a memorial for a dead man presents itself to some as an invitation, a dare, Possibility made manifest in steel, concrete, plastic and wood. Scrutinised for surface, transition, sight, situation, gradient, strength, height, width, depth, breadth and unlawfulness. Architecture goes beyond utilitarian needs. At some unspecified point during the late 80s, the previous government commissioned a group of architects to design and build inconspicuous constructions throughout London. They consisted of blunt spikes placed upon low walls and curious steel rails situated in front of banked concrete. This seemed nonsensical. The government seemed to want the pavement to be both dangerous and safe, seeking to both define and manage use of ostensibly public space. The city holds secrets. Everybody knows that. It's where exchanges are made. Inside the iron ring, clearly marked with its Griffin guardians, visitors are not welcome, especially those that come in the form of a Reclaim the Streets demo. Anarchists are taunted by suits stood in the Lloyd's building elevator, proudly flashing gold cards and sipping champagne. The display is met with displeasure and the situation soon regresses to inevitable violence. One young man in a suit found himself superglued to a wall by his face, a gesture that becomes hollow when followed by the anarchist celebratory drink enjoyed in the city's overpriced pubs and bars, putting money into the pockets they had previously tried to pinch. Canary Wharf is a gleaming, blustery ghost town. The place is such a grotesque waste of marble and steel and clean streets. It feels like a tiny mock-up of a long-forgotten proposal somehow realised and now looks somehow embarrassed. In his book Towards a New Architecture, Le Cabousier states that there are two types of city, one built in a man's way and the other in the pack donkey's way. He describes the former as one completely realised vision. In a city built in a man's way, one should be able to get from one place to another in the quickest, 
most direct route possible. All the parts of the city are built with the other in mind. To achieve this, he designed symmetrical cities with straight roads, which, from a bird's eye view, looked like a mathematical pattern. The primary effect of this complete control would be a total sense of order, because, Le Corbusier said, without order, there is chaos. He identified the packed donkey city as a random mass of zones, with winding streets haphazardly meandering with no real purpose. The packed donkey was lazy, he thought, settling down in an area for a while, building it up and eventually moving on. Le Corbusier accused both Paris and London of being built in such a manner, finding them inhospitable and inefficient. However, the young skaters have no quarrel with this Roman shell of vortexes and constant currents, which strongly discourage entry into or exit from certain zones. They navigate their packed donkey city in a man's way, getting where they want to be in the easiest way possible, scaling any obstacle and gradually eroding the buildings that block their path. Their path to where? To nowhere. To whatever comes. Speaking in 1987, Margaret Thatcher was quoted in Woman's Own magazine as saying, there is no such thing as society. There are individual men and women, and there are families. Whose property? Show me who owns these buildings. No one owns them. They belong to logos which used to represent companies, but have now become a business unto themselves. This is my property. I'm a repo man on wheels with too much spastic energy to be soothed by their foreign language of abbreviated words and monotone shapes. Despite being more than happy to exploit the marketing potential of skating in their brightly coloured advertisements, the Coca-Cola Corporation felt there were limits to this patronage. The capital is late for work and it's the train's fault. Bloody tube, delay, strike, fault. Could the commuter, the victim, ever be at fault? The inefficiency of the commuter rivals that of the London Underground itself. The simple etiquette of the Underground seems to have eluded the vast majority of today's passengers. People standing on the wrong side of the escalator. People simply stopping at the bottom of flights of stairs. People failing to use all available space in a carriage. People entering a carriage whilst people are still trying to exit. People fumbling with ticket machines and bamboozled by the barriers. Really fucking stupid people. The commuter is no live wire, no threat, just a stat, a number. Let him live in dot matrix time. Far more interesting are those that use the tube. Graffers, buskers, beggars. The catacombs of London are to be explored. It's a territorial challenge to govern the underground. Your name meets cold steel, simple, metropolitan and district decorators, lycanthropic youth, escaping sleep's death-like grip to paint these moving postcards that roll into stations while you're on your way to work again, top to bottoms that say, wish you were here, paintings like butterflies that live unseen for a day. It's about getting your name from one side of the city to the other, using urban, true grit, smooth slide, master killer underground rolling stock. When the trains roll to a halt, the night bus comes to life. The last true socialist movement. A standard flat fare for everyone. A people carrier, ferrying home the economic underclass in a glass. Passing by Marble Arch, I stop and spare a thought for the 50,000 people executed there between the 12th century and 1783. The Tiburn Gallows were named after the local river which now runs underground. They were triangular in shape, 18 feet high and could hang up to 24 people at the same time. Despite the intention that public execution should act as a deterrent, 
The actual spectacle itself created so much excitement and hysteria that many of those sentenced to hang were seen as heroes. Some even believed that the touch of a hanged man would cure illness. Tens of thousands of people swarmed Tyburn on execution day, which was also a public holiday. These were referred to as a Tyburn Fair. Once hanged, the bodies of the executed people sometimes convulsed for up to 40 minutes, known as dancing the Paddington Frisk. Because the condemned prisoners were brought to Tyburn from Newgate Prison, the colloquial term for this fate was going west. With this in mind, I begin walking across the park. Youth culture has been stolen, taken away and repackaged. But that's OK, you can buy it back. You can buy back what you already know. Over the counter culture is what we are given. Don't bother thinking because the softback edition will be out soon at a new lower price. Your ideals reduce to slogans, buzzwords. Everything you don't need, everything you already know, watered down and sold back at a price. A habit wax for blood-sucking, supine, medium, middle youth. For kids who never got punk rock, a concept that, despite its facade and newness, is derived from the parent culture it purports to leave behind. Books with no words, hollow inflatable furniture, colour coordinated leisure wear, and, for that crucial part of the evening, pop on the record from the lower mezzanine floor. You know the one, the record with no words. You don't have to try, you don't have to think. A lifestyle readjustment for 200 quid. 200 pounds for a month's worth of cool doodness. Eat money. Spend food. Watch your back. Look out. The digital lifestyle is about. An invisible fog choking up our city with so much noise and non-information from the mouths of vampires. You should close your mouth. You might eat an email by accident. Tasteless spaghetti shapes of ones and zeros. It could once be said that the majority of mobile phone users were the ones with the least to say. However, this no longer applies, as it would seem nowadays they are as easy to obtain as children. New hand-free mobile phone technology has led to an unlikely union between the dressed-down upstarts that use them and the clearly disturbed members of the homeless underclass. Both seemingly spend all day on the streets, oblivious to anyone else, and speak aloud to invisible people. A public dialogue with the voices in their head. In the early 1800s, the architect John Nash conceived and oversaw the construction of Regent Street. He made it clear he intended the street to act as a cordon sanitaire between the scruffs of Soho and the toffs of Mayfair. This distinction rings true today. Mayfair, famous for its superior hotels, tailors and auction houses, has always been something of a rich man's ghetto. The Mayfair itself was a raucous annual fair which moved to the area in 1686, but was suppressed by the residents less than a century later for lowering the genteel tone of the neighbourhood. Soho, the original metropolitan hunting ground, is a different place entirely. It is in fact an island, surrounded by the seas of Regent, Oxford, Charing Cross and Shaftesbury. Most of the area was laid out in the 1670s, just in time to accommodate an influx of Greek Christians fleeing Ottoman persecution and a larger wave of French Protestants forced out of France by Louis XIV. And so began Soho's role as a territory for exiles and outcasts. The few well-to-do people there were quickly left for Mayfair and in moved the artists, bums and revolutionaries. Who knew Soho better than the Colony Room mob? Painters, poets and photographers 
brought together by a common passion for boozy nights in a handful of Soho's pubs, bars and restaurants. Although some of these haunts still exist, many are sadly no more. It is almost as if Soho has become a hard rock cafe of sorts. The evidence remains, but the spirit has long since passed. Old boys will ask for their regular, only to be met with confusion by that week's new face behind the bar. In his infamous low-life contribution to The Spectator, Geoffrey Bernard wrote of Soho frequently. From where I am sitting facing south and from right to left, I can see the Regent's Palace Hotel, the Swiss Centre, the Odeon Leicester Square and the clock on the tower of the St Anne's Church Soho. From the bedroom window I can see Centre Point. Am I already dead and in heaven? I've seen the Rockies, steamed up the Mississippi, down the Nile, entered the temples of Thailand, the heritage in St Petersburg, walked on the gallops by Lambourne at dawn, seen storms at sea, sunsets in the West Indies, women who could break your heart from a hundred miles. But never, ever have I seen anything quite so stunningly beautiful as the rotting fruit and vegetables in Berwick Street Market. So what now? Clipper joints, post-production companies and increased pedestrianisation. Runners get the beers in with petty cash and petty criminals sell crushed up aspirins at Cambridge Circus. Aspirational young would-be directors fill the pubs and clubs with turned up jeans and turned up noses whilst dad dads have a nostalgic half pint at the French house. Traffic is growing for a variety of reasons. Rising affluence leads to increased car ownership, and once people own a car, they tend to use it as much as possible, even for very short journeys. Trends in the United Kingdom over the past 20 years or so show how the link between land use and transport has been breaking down. The trend has not primarily been towards more usage of transport systems because we have a greater population or because we are making more trips but because we are travelling further just to satisfy the same needs. Also, over the past 20 years or so, whilst public transport fares have risen faster even than the growth in incomes, the cost of motoring has actually fallen in real terms, encouraging people to shift from public transport to the car. Allied to this, the providers of services, whether retailers, the leisure industry, health authorities or educational establishments, are not required to take account of the transport effects of their policies and have tended to externalise their transport costs by putting them onto their customers. Similarly, planning policy has often accepted these trends and allowed dispersal to the edge of urban areas. London doesn't love the latent or the lurking, has neither time nor taste, nor sense for anything less discernible than the red flag in front of the steamroller. It wants cash over the counter and letters ten feet high. All cities are geological. You cannot take three steps without encountering ghosts bearing all the prestige of their legends. We move within a closed landscape, 
whose landmarks constantly draw us towards the past. Certain shifting angles, certain receding perspectives allow us to glimpse original conceptions of space, but this vision remains fragmentary. It must be sought in the magical locales of fairy tales and surrealist writings. Castles, endless walls, little forgotten bars, mammoth caverns, casino mirrors. Navigate your city by alternative means. Follow paths of smell, of sound, whatever. When a desire is a physical possibility, you must defy the stifling constraints of the social order and act upon your desire. Smash the symbols of the empire in the name of nothing but the heart's longing for grace.